Okay, we're starting recording. Uh, welcome again to the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Barlon. Just in terms of announcements, we have not one, but two shows this Saturday, the 5th of February. The fir- first will be with Turk Lacour. He will be discussing the ever controversial temple and priest restriction, its history, and other topics. And Jennifer Roach, a former Anglican minister, will be coming on to give a overview of the history and theology of the Anglican Communion. And both these people will also be regular guests, I hope. Tark will be coming on again in the near future to discuss the mind-body problem in philosophy. And Jennifer and myself will be nerding up in the near future about sacramental theology. That will be interesting as well. Uh, we have a few other guests in the pipeline. Uh, my friend Joseph Lowell, who runs the LDS Philosophy YouTube page, will be coming on to discuss and critique Reformed presuppositionalism a very common Calvinistic apologetic. My friend Jeremiah Nortier, who himself is a Calvinist, will be coming on soon to discuss the Reformed Baptist tradition, the one he belongs to. And Carl Cranny will be coming on soon to discuss his doctoral dissertation, The Final Answer to God, The Fate of the Unevangelized in Catholic and Mormon Taught. And just a day or two ago, I got an email from Kevin Burney, who uh, agreed to come on in the near future to discuss his work on the JST, the Joseph Smith translation. If you wish to appear on an episode, send in a question to a guest or recommend a topic or a roundtable discussion, do you drop me an email at scripturalmormonism at gmail.com. We are on Patreon at Scriptural Mormonism and PayPal at Irish LDS if you wish to support this podcast. So also, I hope to be uh, arranging a roundtable on the nature of God, time and foreknowledge with myself, Blake Oster, Tark LaCour and a couple of others. And also, hopefully, a roundtable with my friend Errol Emmy and a couple of others on early Christian history and texts and other topics as well. So be sure uh, to be on the outlook for that. So that's the uh, housekeeping done. I have a very special guest here today who I also consider a good friend, um, Craig Foster. Uh, Craig, um, I'll just put you up here on the uh, view. Uh, Thanks again for coming on. I greatly appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Just in terms of introduction, Craig Foster earned an MA and MLIS at Brigham Young University. He is also an accredited genealogist and works as a research consultant at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. He has published articles about different aspects of Latter-day Saint history. He's the author of two books, co-author of another, and co-editor of a three-volume series, The Persistence of Polygamy, discussing the history and theology of plural marriage. Foster is also on the editorial board of the John Whitmer Historical Association Journal, and that's from the Interpreter Foundation uh, biography, which I'll link to. That also links to a number of these excellent articles on Latter-day Saint history. Uh, Craig, do you have anything else you want to add to that? No. Okay, perfect. Well, today's topic... Sounds great. (laughs) Wonderful. Um, Today's so we'll, topic. So just uh, get going. Oh yeah, and just to introduce the topic, uh, today's topic is a um, topic that unfortunately makes the rounds on Reddish and uh, certain sycophants of a certain YouTube podcast, ex Mormon host, and other um, online venues. It's not really taken seriously in academic academia, both LDS and not LDS, but mm-hmm. it's still a hot button topic, and unfortunately, it comes up a lot. And that is the charge that Joseph Smith, the founder of the church, actually engaged in pedophilia. Um, it's a hot button topic, and everyone agrees pedophilia is sick and it's evil. So if Joseph did engage in this, it would really cast aspersions on his credibility. So today we will be discussing this uh, uh, today. So uh, Craig has kindly offered to uh, give a presentation on this particular topic. And I will note um, the slides for his presentation will also be available on Dropbox. Um, I've put them on uh, my Dropbox, and they will be on the show notes for those interested in simply downloading and reading them at their own pace as well. So uh, Craig, thanks again, and I'll let you um, share the screen and give your presentation. Great, thank you. Okay. So, um, yes, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, Joseph Smith's marriages to teens and the accusations of pedophilia. And um, 
mixed, uh, a lot of the information that I'm going to have today is based on an article that was published um, uh, back in uh, uh, 2019, um, assessing the criticisms of early age Latter-day Saint marriages. Also, uh, there was an essay that I co-wrote with um, uh, David Keller and Greg Smith in um, The Persistence of Polygamy, the first volume. Um, and um, Joseph Smith and the Origins of Mormon Polygamy uh, is the title of the volume. And the essay was uh, about um, basically talking about Joseph Smith and um, and the accusations of pedophilia. It um, is titled um, the, uh, the Age of Joseph Smith's Plural Wives in Social and Demographic con uh, Context. And um, in it, we discussed um, how prevalent was uh, teen marriage and, um, and at what age did uh, young women get married at that time. And uh, we, we had some interesting responses to it. And uh, so my other article was kind of a follow-up as well as addressing um, other issues that uh, had come up regarding um, Joseph Smith and other uh, early members of the church marrying young uh, women. And, um, and uh, accusations of pedophilia. Here are some, uh, some things that you can find online, some quotes that I have found, and I'm just giving just a few of the numerous comments that have been made regarding Joseph Smith marrying uh, a younger um, young women. So a meme found on Pinterest and other sites has a picture of Joseph Smith with the following quote, my wife called me a pedophile. I said, that's a pretty big word for a 14 year old, end quote. <clears throat> Another person commented regarding a Salt Lake Tribune article about post manifesto plural marriage. Imagine that you are 37. Now imagine marrying any eighth or ninth grader. If that's anything but repulsive to you, then you're probably a sicko. And another one uh, wrote on Facebook in 2020, the average age of marriage in 1835 was 21, not in the teenage years Mormons like to think. Also, although uncommon, teenage brides would marry at a young age, but it was to other young grooms. If you did see a 14-year-old girl get married, it was to another 14 or 15-year-old boy, not 37-year-old man and a 14-year-old child. And then another Facebook commentator in 2019 said that people saying a 14-year-old girl marrying a man in his 30s, 40s, 50s, et cetera, was normal, or, uh, was normal, was, quote, presentism at its worst, end quote. Okay, so I wanted to uh, comment about that. And it goes back uh, to the article that I wrote, um, assessing the criticisms of early age Latter-day Saint marriages. It, as a genealogist, and I am an accredited genealogist, uh, as uh, Robert mentioned, uh, in fact, Um, uh, I, I'm accredited uh, in um, uh, Scottish and also in Irish genealogy, but over the years I have done uh, an enormous amount of uh, genealogical research in the United States, Canada, as well as all of Great Britain um, for my job and, and also for uh, personal interest, given that my ancestors basically came from those areas. Um, as well as other parts of Western Europe. So as a genealogist, uh, it has, the, the uh, calling Joseph Smith a pedophile, et cetera, has been an immediate red flag for me uh, because I have found plenty of evidence to the contrary uh, by, by looking at uh, other genealogical and historical information. So here we go into some examples uh, of what I think will set it within context. 
first of all, uh, definitions of uh, pedophilia. A uh, pedophilia is defined as the primary or exclusive sexual interest in prepubescent children. Hemophilia is defined as this strong, persistent sexual interest by adults in pubescent children between the ages of 11 and 14. And ephebophilia is defined as the primary sexual interest in later adolescence, which is typically uh, defined as ages 15 to 19. Okay, anyone knowing of the plural marriages of Joseph Smith will have to immediately rule out that Joseph Smith was a, was a pedophile or pedophile. Now let's look at hebophilia and phebophilia. Was Joseph Smith basically primarily sexually interested in In, um, um, pre, in pubis children ages 11 to 14, or for that matter, even in um, adolescence ages 15 to 19. So here are uh, the marriages of Joseph Smith that are divided by age. And um, what I did was I, I used three different uh, uh, sources for this. And I wanted to make them kind of general sources out there available on the internet that anyone uh, doing their own searching could see. Uh, so, um, and I wanted to mention very quickly, these sources are uh, A, so column A will be Remembering the Wives of Joseph Smith, which is found at wivesofjosephsmith.org. B, is Mormonism Research Ministry. And it's based on George D. Smith's book, Nauvoo Polygamy, but we called it Celestial Marriage. And I was even gracious enough, despite that Mormonism Research Ministry and all of their brilliance, identified George D. Smith as George A. Smith. I changed it to George D. Smith because I know how to look up books and see what the guy's name is. And then um, column C is Wikipedia. Okay, with that in mind, let's take a look here. So in column A, three wives. In column B, they said that he had 37 wives. And in column C, Wikipedia, they said that he had 49 wives. Now, the I'm not gonna read all of this to you. I don't want to bore you stiff, but um, there is some difference here. And then you have a question mark where um, the ages were unknown. And uh, so there were three that were unknown uh, in column B and 13 uh, that were unknown in column C, thus uh, kind of pointing back to around 33, 34, 35 wives or so. And we have the ages then for these various wives. As you can see, the four teens in column A was 10, in column B it was nine, and in column C, 11 teens. Three to four of those teens, column A, three being in column B, and four in column C. So they were aged 19, uh, a couple of them just barely, barely before they uh, turned 20. Then of uh, Joseph Smith's um, uh, wives that were aged 17 or below, six to seven of them were ages uh, 17. Uh, the number for A and B and seven for C. And so I just want to say very quickly that what that shows is, yes, Joseph Smith had teen wives. Were um, uh, the uh, pubescent 
age is 11 to 14, or the later maturity uh, um, or later teens, ages 15 to 19, were they interest? No, they were not. As you can see, um, uh, the women in, uh, in the ages 20s through 50s made up the majority of the women that he married. So the, the old thing of, it was Joseph Smith a pedophile? No, he was not a pedophile, absolutely not. He didn't have any wives that were prepubescent. Where he focused on the teens. No, he actually didn't focus on the teens either. Um, it was a sampling across uh, uh, the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, with even a few in the 50s that, uh, of women that he married. Now, I want to discuss what was considered common or uncommon, or at, uh, if common, in, in how common were the ages for marrying? We're going to focus on marrying uh, teens because obviously that was the point of my article. That's the point of this presentation. And another thing that we're uh, also going to state right up front, which I should have said actually at the very beginning, I had planned to, um, which is we're not gonna argue was Joseph Smith's plural marriages, was that common? Well, of course it wasn't common. Most So that's right there. It was not common, but we're, um, we're not even going to discuss were they right, were they wrong. That doesn't matter for the purpose of this presentation, which is discussing uh, how common or uncommon was it to marry um, young women in their teens. All right. Um, there's a quote by uh, Jack Larkin who wrote in the reshaping of everyday life, 17940. He wrote, a trip westward was almost a demographic journey back in time. Family sizes in communities further west mirrored those in much longer settled places a generation or two previously. The women of Sugar Creek, Illinois, for example, were marrying four to five years younger on the average than those in Sturbridge or Deer, Deerfield, Massachusetts. And there's a reason why I have that quote and a couple of others to kind of set up uh, what I want to explain. Another quote, uh, and this is from um, uh, Nicholas Surratt, uh, Surratt in his book, American Child Bride, A History of Minors and Marriage in the United States. He wrote, for most of American history, <clears throat> there was no distinction between the marriage of two minors or that between one party who was older, sometimes considerably so, and one who was younger. In fact, marrying at the age of 14 was not at all uncommon throughout the nation in the middle of the 19th century. And, um, I wanted to give you an example. In 1880, which is the first year that the United States Census linked marital status, almost 12% of the girls ages 15 to 19 were married. Now, is that a significant amount? Uh, no, in the great scheme of things, obviously it's not a significant amount. However, that is actually a fairly large amount when you uh, think of uh, the number of, of uh, girls ages 15 to 19. Um, also, based on, historic, on historical marriage patterns, it appears that even as early as the 1850s, the marriage of young people was least common in the industrializing Northeast and most common in the South, Midwest, and West. And I'm going to explain why that was the case and also um, 
why uh, um, I had that quote about the further west uh, you moved, uh, a person moved back in the 1800s, the lower the marriage age was. So, and also I want to kind of explain about the fact that male, female, differential in median age at first marriage was quite large in the 19th century. Kind of putting that in our terms, um, females got married at a much younger age than males did um, in 19th century. And uh, female, uh, or I mean, and wife, husband relationships at times were uh, quite a few years difference between the age of the, of the woman getting married and the man who was marrying her. And again, that was for a good reason. Okay, so factors creating the right climate for early age marriages. And these factors, I've, I uh, have this in my article on assessing the criticisms of, er of early age marriage. And um, it's based on my research and my own experience, both in uh, genealogical as well as historical research. And these factors were economic, demographic, and cultural. So for example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention cultural really quickly. Um, the uh, uh, women tended to marry at an earlier age in the South, not only for economic or demographic reasons, and, um, and we'll mention that in a little bit more detail, but also for cultural reasons. Uh, culture in the uh, down in the South, particularly down in the mountain uh, South, the Appalachia uh, Mountains, etc., um, was quite different from the culture up in the Mid Atlantic states or up in New England. And so, because culturally uh, of these differences, women tended to marry at a later age up in the Mid Atlantic states and New England than they did down in the southern states, not only in the southwestern part um, of the Old South, but also the southeastern part. Now, often these factors involved at least to working together. Furthermore, time and place were very important and usually influenced or were influenced by the above three factors. And as a genealogist, um, helping people do their genealogy, uh, one thing that uh, I would always say, and I'm not alone in saying that among accredited genealogists is time and place. You've got to always keep in mind time and place. All right, there's a couple of quotes. The frontier often necessitated early marriages. Reasons to marry were accelerated. Reasons not to marry were, were eliminated. And these reasons to marry um, in many ways involved economics. Uh, while land was not as readily available back on the Eastern seaboard uh, where um, it had been settled for a couple of centuries by that point, uh, land was much more, and so uh, the the men were looking for a wife. They wanted to have a wife. They wanted to have children uh, to help them uh, eventually on the farm uh, to do the various chores. And so, because of that, because of uh, readily readily available land, uh, land was cheap, um, and that meant that. Um, early marriages occurred. So the marrying was accelerated uh, or reasons to marry and reasons not to uh, were eliminated. While back East, they, it uh, was much more difficult to uh, get land at an early age. Usually they had to inherit, etc., And so that meant um, a longer waiting period to get married. Now, the frontier also tended to blur the meanings of age and allow for marriage of girls who might be seen as too young for marriage in other situations. Because of frontier conditions, young girls in the West matured rapidly, 
They were courted at a very young age uh, by much older men and were sometimes married when only a few years into their teens. Furthermore, women in newer regions started childbearing earlier and continued longer, uh, thus having larger families once again because it was economically um, helpful to have a large family that, as they could help out on the farm. But also, um, Uh, territory, um, such as in Wyoming, Montana, uh, not in Wyoming as much, Montana, sorry, Nevada, um, uh, Arizona, Colorado, they would marry at a, at a younger age because there was a scarcity of women. And so when, since women were um, uh, in high demand, then they would look to younger ages because um, that's where they needed to look in order to age, but still young enough that uh, she had not yet uh, got married. And so you have to keep uh, that in mind too. So Albert uh, Hurtado, uh, who's a California historian, wrote about California's population. And this was, this was in um, California of the 18, mid 1840s, to the early 1850s. So during the time of, of early settlement, and then of course the time of the gold rush. Um, so he wrote, there were too many men competing for too few women. This basic fact was plain in the operation of the marriage market where women had many opportunities to marry and men had few. And a former pioneer immigrant uh, remembered it was customary in early days in California for girls to marry at 14, 15, and 16 years of age. Um, in fact, um, the Donner Party, um, as I'm sure you're all aware of uh, the Donner Party, after they had been rescued, 13-year-old Virginia Reed um, was, um, was, received a marriage proposal shortly after being rescued she turned down her suitor. Um, she actually received several uh, proposals for marriage. Uh, eventually she married uh, another man three years later when she was 16. But another uh, Donner Party member married. She was 13 at the time and her husband, I'm going uh, based on memory here, her husband was in his either in his late 30s or early 40s, and Maryville, California is named for her, um, if uh, any of you are from Marysville, California. Um, anyway, um, so as you can see, those are some examples of, of uh, marrying young because the marriage market uh, was constrained uh, due to the lack of marriageable women. I wanted to uh, just kind of go over the census really quickly to kind of give you an idea of the difference between marriage age um, uh, in the different census years, and then particularly in the different parts of the United States. So we have mean age of marriage, uh, male in 1850, male 26.8, female 23.1, um, percent of married males 15 to 19, male 1.7 percent of males 15 to 19 were married. So the person saying, oh, if they did get married when they were younger, um, you know, when they were 14, well, they married uh, a 14 year old girl, married a boy 14 or 15. No, not very common, not at all. That's one reason why I kept that quote, I thought, yeah, you obviously have not done any genealogical or historical research. Marriage, though, of females, all females, um, of those um, um, females 15 to 19, the percent who were married was 12.2%. Once again, was it the majority? Far from it. But that is a significant amount of, uh, of women aged 15 to 19 when you think of the whole population. But you'll notice 1860, 70, and 80, 
it slowly started to decrease. And that's because of the opportunities in terms of economics, et cetera, um, were getting smaller and smaller uh, in the United States as uh, the settlement took place across the country by that point. Okay. Now, let's look at the New England census region. In 1850, the number of females ages 15 to 19 that were married was 7.7%. Percent and it decreased slowly, but it decreased as um, as the uh, census years went on. But in the West North Central Census region, and that would include where Illinois was in 1850, 205 percent of all females ages 15 through 19 were married. And once again, that too decreased, particularly because Illinois and all that area was was getting settled and um, and you know as the years went on and so for each decade the percent of uh, young women ages 15 to 19 that were married went down uh, that's to be expected and now mountain and Pacific census regions and unfortunately they didn't have the statistics for 1850 um, for, for the mountain and Pacific. Because in some areas, the censuses weren't done at all. In other areas, they were only partially done. There were, you know, it was problematic because the area was sparse and the few spots there, there were, um, you, you know, that were settled. They had censuses for uh, those areas, but um, they, they were problematic. So they don't have that, which is a shame because I think it would be um, really much higher. But by 1860, as you can see, there were still 32.4% of all females ages 15 to 19 were married. And that decreased um, and, and even to a point of significantly by 1880, but still that was much higher than it was back east. Um, so, so that gives you a, a visual of um, how many women were married and um, what, uh, um, what the percentage was. And also gives you a visual of change, uh, you know, dealing with that. So basically, Nauvoo of the 1840s, um, it was on the edge of the Western frontier. It exhibited many of the characteristics of frontier society. And Utah was certainly a frontier setting through much of the latter 19th century. So it's understandable that marriages in both Nauvoo and Utah um, would reflect frontier marriage patterns as I've, uh, and um, that's it. I'll uh, stop uh, sharing. Well, thank you, uh, Craig. That was uh, very informative. And for those listening, I will put a link on uh, to my Dropbox where one can actually download the slides if they wish to read them at their own leisure. Um, in your article, which I think everyone should read after going through that as a very good entree, if you will, you mentioned actually something that is relevant in your own family history. So I was wondering if you could give a brief overview of that. And also, was there any furore or controversy about yes. such a um, marital arrangement? I'm sorry, what was the second question? Oh, if there was any controversy or furore, if you will, about oh, the uh, oh, yes. okay. arrangement. <laughs> I'll be glad to mention that, yeah. Okay, so first of all, um, in my own family, um, my, uh, um, on my father's side, my great-great-grandmother, they would have married, it would have been a right around 18, um, I think it was about 1882, maybe 1880, so in Colorado. And um, they had, uh, my great-great-grandmother had been uh, born in Iowa, 
and moved to Colorado at a fairly young age. She was married uh, to, um, to my great great grandfather. She had turned 16 about two months previous to her marriage. And he had literally just barely turned, I think it was 39, if I remember correctly. Uh, so they were married about Colorado and was considered one of the pillars of the community. So they were married and uh, not, not an eye was uh, batted. No one questioned uh, the age difference nor the fact that she was uh, 16. Um, and they were not members of the LDS church. Um, and so that's one example. And her older sister had married at age 15. And, and again, no one had even questioned uh, her getting married at 15. Um, then um, the other example I have is much further back. Uh, I descend from a French Canadians, you know, Quebecois. Um, and um, and I, I discussed that uh, to quite a bit in the article about um, the early Quebec marriages because uh, of the fact that here there was a dearth of marriageable women. And to the point where the French government um, had women volunteer to, to travel to Quebec. They gave them a, a nice dowry, gave them money, and for every child that was born, they gave them uh, some money uh, once they got to Quebec and married because they wanted to you know, uh, have a larger population. And um, the, uh, the, the young women who uh, came in the first uh, uh, ships were known as uh, Les Filles du Roi, uh, the, the king's daughters, because the king was the one sponsoring them. Uh, and so I descend from a couple of uh, Filles du Roi. And, um, and, but then even the second generation, oh, and I might add, the, the marriageable women were ages uh, 12 to, I think it was uh, 35, something like that. Um, so that, that was the marriageable women that were sent from France. But even in the second generation, the, they had um, uh, marriages at a very early age. And uh, two of my ancestors, one was 13, and her husband was um, somewhere between the age of 28 and 33, depending on what record you look at. And the other one, I think she had just barely turned 14, and her husband was about 38. So uh, they obviously were not Mormons, they were Catholic. So, so um, this was something that was practiced only by Mormons. This was something that was um, that was general across the board, if the time and place uh, was appropriate for uh, marrying at that young of, of an age. And then uh, your your question about uh, um, did um, did uh, uh, you know what was the reaction to the article? Uh, first, I'll give you the reaction to. To, um, um, to that article or to the essay in the book, uh, once again, um, uh, Persistence of Polygamy. Um, I had given a presentation where I talked about marriage age because um, it, like I said, it's a, it's a pet peeve of mine as a genealogist. And so I had given a presentation and my friend uh, um, uh, Todd Compton, uh, then uh, about, uh, four or five months later, gave a presentation at the symposium uh, talking about, okay, what really was the marriage age, uh, common marriage age? And so um, his presentation and then essay uh, was early marriage in the New England and Northeastern states and in Mormon polygamy. What was the norm? Where he argued that, well, these, uh, most of the members of the church were from New England and the mid-Atlantic states. So they were 
used to marrying at a much later age, though so, uh, he argued that um, that that was not the norm. Um, when I heard about it, uh, I contacted him and um, and I said, "Well, you've got to have your essay in our book." Um, and I said that to my uh, to my uh, co-editor, Newell Bringhurst. I said, "We've got to have his essay in, in the book because we need to have a point counterpoint." So it's in the book, and um, and so each of the readers. They can read both essays and decide for themselves, but I'd recommend that they also uh, read uh, my, uh, my article from Interpreter. Um, so that was one reaction. The reaction to the Interpreter on, um, on Reddit, which um, is an interesting place. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. I don't go on to uh, Reddit very often because, you, you know, I'm just not a masochist. Um, and um, but um, I have read some responses. Um, anything from uh, this guy's a pervert, um, meaning myself. Um, <laughs> this guy is a pervert. By the way, my wife was twenty when we got married. So <laughs> um, I, to uh, to well, he may have some points, but the, but still. Joseph Smith was marrying a bunch of uh, women, so that's made it out of the ordinary. Well, yes, but um, that doesn't cover the age thing. So that was the reaction. Yeah, uh, Reddit is where IQ pints go to die, so I don't blame you for not giving it much credence. <laughs> <laughs> but but let me just so say I, uh, I did want oh I'm oh I'm sorry yeah. uh, some who will be I have lost sound oh well uh, this is just the second episode and everything that could go wrong has gone wrong in the last two episodes but the name Todd Compton will be known to a number of people he's written the book um in Sacred Loneliness, to Plural Wives of Joseph Smith, that came out in Signature in, I believe, either 97 or 98. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, one of the better books, comparatively speaking, although there's a lot of uh, bad books out there, uh, until Brian Hales and Craig and Neural Bringhurst have produced their volumes. But, um, you know, I have to give you credit for, like, uh, doing something that shows intellectual honesty and integrity, and this is how history should be done, given the other side the batter of the other side, shall we say, because there's a lot of bad stuff out there, a fair hearing, as you did in the article, uh, in, in the book. So, uh, fair news for that. Um, but um, yes. you were about to say, you were about um, to say something else? Yeah. I uh, guess yeah, so, um, I also wanted to talk about, um, and, I, and I, I discussed this a little bit more in the article, but um, it, you know, so why did things change? Well, it changed, uh, you know, partly because of economics um, and partly because of demographics, but it also changed uh, because of the progressive movement. Um, so the progressive movement started in the later 1800s and went into, uh, obviously, into the 20th century. And, and so uh, the concept of childhood was developed and and uh, where where really the concept of childhood had been much different previous to that um, emphasis on a prolonged childhood became the the, uh, the you know the main opinion. Um, but I wanted to mention really quickly, and this I got this from another article that uh, um, uh, where Nicholas Sarret was um, who's the author of American Child Bright. He was interviewed and he talked about um, that, uh, that um, he said in a society not structured around age norms, marrying early was far less noteworthy. But it's interesting to note that even, even in the 1900s, from the 1910s to the 19s, between 8 and 10% of all 17 year old girls were married. So even that late, it was still, uh, uh, you know, a common. My my mother, who did not get married that early, <laughs> but uh, my mother uh, had a cousin. They were very close. Uh, they were about two months apart, three months apart in you know in age, and her cousin got married at sixteen, and and, and she's said, 
you, you need to get married sooner you're made. So that, and that was uh, still, you know, a, um, an attitude. And that would have been uh, about 1940, uh, 42. Um, so, you know, it, uh, it, it, it did continue for a while, even into the 20th century. And I know it's a bit anecdotal as well, but like even in yeah, rural parts it's of anecdotal. Ireland. I, oh yeah, but like even in rural parts of Ireland, I should say, it was pretty much the same as well. Uh, you would get married. It would be very unusual to be in your mid-20s and not be married for either of the two genders. Um, and that's pretty recent as well. So, uh, Craig, um, again, I do greatly appreciate um, you providing this excellent overview of the, uh, the question. And hopefully, um, again, we will have you on in another episode, uh, sans the technical issues here and there, on um, one of your other topics that you'd like to discuss, and that is the issue of violence in the early West and Latter-day Saint history. Um, I will be linking to Craig's interpreter pr uh, profile page, where a number of his articles that touch upon this and other issues will uh, be found for free on the interpreter website. So, uh, Craig, again, uh, I do greatly appreciate um, all the excellent work you've done on Latter-day Saint history and for coming on today um, and being very generous with your time. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful. Until then, um, God bless. And uh, as I said, we have two episodes coming up in the next few days with Jennifer Roach on Anglicanism and Tarek Lacour on the Temple and Priesthood Restriction. And if you wish to contact me and suggest guests, or even if you wish to come on, drop me an email at scripturalmormonism at gmail.com. Until then, take care.